This uh, screencast is the second part of the course devoted to regression in event history analysis. The most commonly used explanatory variables are those that characterize the individual at birth, for example, sex, ethnicity, caste, etc. It is assumed that the effect of these variables is constant through the life of the individual. Their effect is assumed to be proportional to the annual probability of knowing the event being studied, as explained in the previous screencast about the Cox model. The events experienced by the individual since birth or the beginning of observation, and which may have influenced his chances of knowing the event studied, can also be introduced in the form of explanatory variables. These variables are then called time-varying covariates. In long format, the time-varying covariates are considered in the same way as the fixed variables. Their introduction has the effect of making the model more dynamic, since it makes it possible to closely follow the path of individual lives. These variables explain most of the heterogeneity of the time to event. Time varying covariates also have the effect of reducing the effect of the proportionality assumption. In fact, they generally act over shorter periods of time and stick better to the changes of environment. It must therefore be used to the fullest. Suppose we have conducted a migration analysis with a Cox model with timeline covariates describing family and occupational histories. Take the case of a woman who has been observed since the age of 15 on the following graph. This woman remained single, then married, then had a child, and a second child sometime before the end of observation. During this time, she was first in school and then unemployed before becoming self-employed, then employed as an employee before being unemployed. Note that periods of change of activity do not necessarily correspond to period of family change. The Cox model provides us with the hazard ratios for family status as well as for occupation. These risks are measured relative to a reference category, single for family status, at school for occupation. Let's see how to represent these different changes, representing the risks of migrating throughout a lifeline. Values of hazard ratios greater than 1 indicate more risk of migrating, values between 1 and 0 lower risk of migrating. Therefore, the Cox model provides risk relative to the reference category. After a period of celibacy and at school, this woman saw her chances increase by 2.4 during a period of unemployment. It turns out that at the end of this unemployment, she married at the same time that she started a period of self-employment. These two status changes reduced her risk of migration by 50% and by 60% respectively. In total, this is equivalent to a reduction by 80% or a division by 5 as compared to the reference category. However, when she stopped being self-employed to become an employee, her chances of migrating multiply by 2.8. Considering that she was still married, her chances were multiplied by 2.8 times 0 0.4, that is by 1.4, as compared to the reference category. However, when she had a child, the chances were again divided by 2 as compared to when she was married with no children. The relative chances were then 30% less than for the reference category. When she was unemployed again, her chances reduced slightly to about 40% below the chance of the reference category. A new child, however, augmented her chance to migrate, 
maybe to a bigger house to accommodate the growing family. By the time of last observation, this woman had 20% more chance to migrate than when she was a bachelor at school. Of course, the calculations behind these relative hazards are not done individually. These relative risks do not mean that the life of this woman complied with these calculations. She might as well have migrated even though her odds were low. Or she may not have migrated while these odds were high. These calculations are made on the basis of the average behavior of the entire population observed. The moment of change and the time spent in each status are obviously variable from one individual to another. The Cox model simply tells us what are the risks associated with a particular status regardless of the timing of changes or the time spent in each status. Since time-dependent variables capture events that themselves have occurred in response to other events, taking these variables into account allows for better consideration of biographical dynamics and the order of events during life. Let's go back to the question of causality. Time-dependent variables should not make us forget that the precedence of one event over another is not synonymous with causality. Anteriority is a necessary condition but not sufficient to prove causality. Indeed, human beings are capable of anticipation. This means that when you believe that an event is going to take place, you change your behavior accordingly. You can change your status because you believe the event is going to take place. For example, you can change your residence, take a bigger apartment, because you are expecting a baby. This is called the problem of fuzzy time. First, events may not be recorded accurately enough. Even if they are dated by the day, that doesn't mean that the dates are reliable. Second, the collection of dates and thus the succession of events could be biased for one reason or another. There is what is called posterior rationalization, which means, for example, to declare a conventional order of events, for example, a marriage and then a birth, whereas it is perhaps the opposite that took place. Third, anticipation exists, but can it be well evaluated? For some events, it is possible to account for a certain degree of anticipation. For example, if we know the date of birth, we can estimate the time when the pregnancy was confirmed by subtracting six months from the date of birth. The date of engagement can be helpful in accounting for the relationship of the bride and groom during the pre-marriage period. For some diseases, we can estimate the duration of incubation before the first symptoms. The date of signing a contract may be more important than its implementation date, etc. As was said in a previous screencast, the accuracy of recording dates in the field must always be greater than the accuracy of the analysis time. The immediate advantage is that the shorter the unit of time used for the calculations, the less the problem of tied failures will be. High accuracy in the collection also reduces the problem of fuzzy time, especially to analyze the interaction between events. The order of events is thus better respected, giving less chance that two events take place at exactly the same time. However, it is best to set a minimum time for exposure to risk. For example, it may be useful to shift the entry into observation, left censoring, if the risk is strongly conditioned by exposure to another environment. For example, if you analyze mortality, it may be wise to exclude the first six months after immigration because the deaths during this period are probably due to the exposure to risks in the environment of origin and not in the study area of destination. 
When events are very close to each other, it is quite possible that anticipation effects bias the relationship between these two events. It may be useful to anticipate one of the events by a few months or weeks to check if the effect of this event on the other remains the same. Thank you and work well.